Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. I had never done this before, but I contacted out of the blue a keyboard player whose music I really like, and I asked to fix a piece of his gear. And I was totally thrilled when he sent in his Oxford synthesizer company, Oscar, for me to make some repairs to. I recorded some video along the way. For me, this video is cool because of who owns the keyboard. For you, it might be cool because it's a look inside a rare and unusual keyboard. This keyboard's housed in wood, plastic, and rubber, and its appearance and construction and short-lived company and scarce availability of parts uh, make it kind of like the DeLorean of synthesizers. So let's dive in and work on getting the synth able to power up. So I've opened it up and I've removed the circuit board with the pots and push button switches. And the first order of business that I'm going to do is take care of the power cord and the input voltage. So you might be able to see there's a little UK written in pen there. Um, this obviously was a European model and it's configured to run on 240 volts. Um, this was originally what, when it came to me, what was, was on the power cord. And uh, this looks to be like a dryer plug. It's not a European plug, but something someone put on there maybe to, to run it in their home and at first I was thinking I'd put this you know basically just swap this out with a with a North American three prong uh, plug but this is this is clunky so I'm gonna take the extra time and I'm gonna change out the power cord so I can have a nice normal power cord with a small normal sized plug anyway and then I've got to convert it over to uh, uh, 120 volts uh, the, the transformer has a dual primary windings so I should be able to uh, reconfigure this somehow without replacing the transformer to run on our voltage here. So you can see from the plug follow it through this side panel and the power cord comes around here and splits off. The brown is the hot, blue is the neutral so it comes over here to the fuse and the power switch and then goes over here to the transformer. Uh, there's no input voltage selector switch, so we are going to have to see... Okay, this, this comes, comes down like that. And there you go, the, uh, the, the taps are all labeled. So we see that uh, there's dual primaries. And actually, it looks like they have it wired wrong. They have the, uh, the hot brown connected to the neutral. Uh, zero volts and they have the neutral connected to the what should be the hot the 120 volts there but basically there's dual primary windings and uh, they are connected here in series so the um, there's a little bridge here connecting them together so basically each of these windings drops 120 volts across it what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewire this uh, there's like a little jumper here we're gonna remove this jumper and we are going to, to wire these in parallel um, and we're actually going to put the hot on the hot and the neutral on the neutral like it should be. So I'm going to do that with the new power cord and then we'll move on to the next thing. So now I've got a nice normal power cord here without a clunky plug connected and the hot still goes to the fuse and the switch uh, except this time it goes into the terminal designated as the hot on the transformer. And I've uh, added some wires here to put these two primary windings in parallel. Uh, and I've tested it out and I'm getting the correct output voltage there on the secondaries. The next order of business is going to be here on the circuit board with all the pots and push button switches. Uh, this is where it came from. The first order of business is going to be getting rid of this NICAD battery. And I don't know if you can see, but there's little crystals forming here. The battery is starting to corrode, so it looks like this one got to me just in the nick of time uh, before any damage was done, but uh, the battery has started to leak. So I'm going to remove that for now and we'll figure out what to do with it uh, later. But uh, what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to clean all these these pots and switches. Uh, the switches look okay. The pots, they look pretty nasty. No doubt they're scratchy and everything like that. So I'm going to clean all the the junk off the outside of it before I try to do any cleaning to the internals. So I've got the pots cleaned and I put the circuit board back just uh, temporarily. I still have to deal with the battery, which I've removed, and uh, fired it up and it's making sound. Uh, 
but as you can hear, as you hopefully can hear, uh, there's a loud hum in the background. And that's actually the problem uh, that the, uh, the owner sent it in for me to fix. Uh, we were hoping it would go away when we converted it to 110 volt North American voltage, but that's not the case, so we're going to have to track that down. So for the battery, we could replace it with the kind that was on there before. But there's four good reasons not to. Uh, number one, this battery has a funky footprint and size. And while it's still available, it's not a very common battery. Uh, number two, the battery is small. Uh, this one only has a capacity of 110 milliamp hours. So you'd have to use a synth regularly to top it off and keep it from losing all your presets. Number three, the battery is soldered to the main circuit board. So that forces the owner to send the keyboard to someone like me and pay to have it changed when it goes bad. And number four, NICAD batteries just plain suck. And the battery will eventually leak and corrode onto the circuit board. And I showed you, I don't know if you can see it now, the little crystals forming as this battery is starting to leak. And uh, we caught this one just in time. But if you mount NICAD or alkaline batteries directly onto a circuit board, you're really asking for trouble. And one more thing, this battery is not recyclable in Australia, and we, we just can't have that, so we need to come up with another solution. This was my solution. What I've done is I've stuck a AA battery holder on the bottom of the case. I've got three commonly available AA nickel metal hydride cells in there that have a capacity of 2000 milliamp hours, about 20 times what the original battery had. If the cells eventually go bad, the owner can just take them out and throw them away and, re and uh, replace them himself for a dollar each, instead of having to take the synth to a tech. If the battery should ever leak, the battery holder can be replaced also without a tech, and no parts of the synth get damaged. Yeah, I'm putting myself out of a job years down the road, but it's the right solution. The wires for the battery holder come up here in the space between the two circuit boards, and there's a connector here to disconnect the battery holder so you can remove this circuit board. So the drawback to this approach is you need to back up your patches, uh, your data, before you remove this circuit board from the case. I considered mounting the battery holder to the bottom of the case, the bottom of the, sorry, the bottom of the circuit board, uh, but I thought the greater physical separation between the batteries and the circuit board would be more important. And besides, the circuit board won't need to come out very often particularly after I'm done with it. Plus, you're going to lose your patches anyway if you take out just this board because the battery is connected to this board, but the memory that the battery preserves is connected to the board on the right. So at this point, I've removed the ground loop that was causing the hum and the output, and I did it without defeating the earth grounding. So you can hear now there's no noise or hum, and the output is very clean. I've cleaned the pots, and I've installed the batteries, in the battery holder and I've reloaded the factory patches through the MIDI interface. One thing that I noticed which may help you was before I reloaded the factory patches I would have a hard time getting the synth to boot. You turn it on and it would have all or most of the octave LEDs on and be unresponsive for the first several attempts at powering it up. Since I installed the good batteries and reloaded the factory patches, uh, it's been booting without any problem. So if your Oscar won't boot, you might check your battery or uh, reload your factory patches. Before I close this up and let you listen to it, the last thing I'm going to try to do is fix these push button switches. The switches themselves are fine, but you can see by the pot shafts here next to them that these switches are way lower than the front panel. So what they did is they put these little black caps on them. Uh, on top of the switch and tried to hold it on with these little brown bands. And uh, the problem is the brown bands don't hold the caps, so they just fall right off. You can see here on the bender that these two caps are still intact, but uh, the one here on the left is missing. So to push that button, you've got to jam something down the hole, and uh, that, that's really no good. This one came in with only four buttons sticking up above the panel, and one of them was the wrong color. I found a few more rolling around inside the case, but some are missing and some of the brown bands have just uh, crumbled apart. So I figured this would be a simple enough part that would make a good opportunity to get my feet wet with 3D printing. I was able to model a part that I think will be a good replacement, and I've ordered my very first 3D printer. So when it comes in a couple days, I'll print them and give it a shot. You might have caught a glimpse of this connector earlier, but check it out up close. 
the plating on the uh, the male header side is is all coming off and it makes me wonder what's going on on the socket side it's pretty well established this connector is a major weak spot on the Oscar so even though we're not noticing any problems with it yet we should replace it and uh, since we're changing both sides we'll spare no expense and use these genuine gold plated Molex connectors gold plating is the best but if you're only changing one side of the connector don't just blindly replace it with gold you should match the plating on the other side because if you mate tin with gold the connection will corrode over time so we also have a problem where the customer reported where it'll jump to uh, preset number one in the middle of playing and I was able to reproduce that and I'll just fiddle with it for a while until it does it. And what it appears to be is... Bad IC socket. So I'm going to take this out, I'm going to change that IC socket, and I'm also going to change the two IC sockets that this uh, little daughter board mates to. And indeed, this IC socket looks to be about the lowest possible quality IC socket that you can buy. Uh, these are a better quality socket, but we are going to replace those. I noticed that down here, one of these little, um, little leaves got folded over, so it's probably not making the... Uh, as ideal contact as it should when this is when the little daughter board's inserted back in. So we're going to change this, this, and this. And we're going to clean the legs of this IC chip. You can see that they're a little tarnished toward the bottom where they were inserted into that socket. So we'll clean those up before we put it back in. Here's the chip. It cleaned up a little bit. Here's those sockets changed. I wound up leaving this smaller one. This socket looked okay and on the back the uh, the pads are a little funky like missing. And I don't think anyone did that and damaged it. You can see I, I started desoldering here until I got to that one. And I was like, what? Uh, I think that's how it may have came from the factory. So that's kind of sketchy. And since the socket wasn't so bad, I decided to leave it. And here's the finished product all closed up. Because of the MIDI daughter board, which sits here, the panel doesn't sit perfectly parallel to the circuit boards. So it took a few passes revising the little push button cap so they'd all come above the panel and not bind in their holes. The Oscar sounds pretty punchy and would make some great leads and bass lines. Overall, this is a pretty cool looking and sounding synth. Even though it has some unusual construction and is known for reliability issues, if you've got a broken Oscar the Grouch lying around, you should definitely fix it. Thanks for watching and see you all again soon.